Greetings and welcome back. So we're getting to the end of this section of the course that was devoted to dynamics using rate equations. And I hope I have illustrated for you the diversity of applications of the idea. We've, we've gone from enzymes to genetic circuits to microtubule lengths. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about damn pandemics. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, this, is, this is a case where something that, at least for me, over many years in science was a bit abstract and a bit academic, which is, you know, the dynamics of how diseases spread and so on. And it's the sort of thing that, you know, you learn about either in a course on differential equations or maybe in a, in a course on... Um, on exactly like this, on some maybe ecology and evolution and so on. But the, the thing is, is that this has all been made so much more real. You know, today uh, we had roughly, today is uh, January 27th, 2021, and we had nearly 4,000 deaths in the United States from SARS-CoV-2. And the thing that I want to point out is that, you know, we have memorials uh, to, to Pearl Harbor where it's not to take anything away from Pearl Harbor, but you know that that was something on the order of three thousand people, and today four thousand, roughly four thousand people died. So we're having like a Pearl Harbor or a nine eleven every single day, and have been every day more or less over the entire month of January. So, you know, this is uh, this is a situation with obviously real consequences. And what I wanted to do is just give a little bit of background into how we could use rate equations to think about these problems. And, I, and before I do that, I need to do a little bit of background work. So I, I want to start just by commenting on viruses. And, you know, it probably seems a little off, a little tone deaf, to use a popular phrase, to refer to viruses as beautiful. But, you know, frankly, they, they occupy this sort of interesting netherworld between the living and the non-living. And you know, they're clearly made of biological molecules, the macromolecules that we're very used to from biology, and they form these amazing and bizarre structures. Like you can see here, the example of you know, Ebola and rabies, and you know, over on the right, you can see herpes and pox virus and so on. And the thing that I, the main thing I want to point out here is simply that um, that there are. For my purposes, there are RNA viruses, which means that their genomic material comes in the form of RNA, which is indeed the case of coronavirus, which you see at the lower right on the left-hand side. And then there are DNA viruses of, of a great variety, including the herpes virus. And for, for my purposes, really all that I want you to take away from this is that viruses have a length scale, let's say between 50 and 150 nanometers, that they harbor within them something between you know, as little as 3,000 nucleotides and as many as, at least for um, coronavirus that's circulating right now, that's around 30,000 nucleotide um, genome. So, um, you know, here's just to give you an impression of the relative sizes of things. So the beautiful picture at the top was made by David Goodsell, and this is a scale depiction of the size of the virus, which is around 100 nanometers, and then the length of the genome, I just remind you that the distance between bases in, in DNA or RNA is around a third of a nanometer per nucleotide. And since it's 30,000 nucleotides long, that gives us 10,000 nanometers, which is the same as 10 microns. We have a 10 micron genome, which is compressed inside of this little tiny 100 nanometer capsid. So viruses have been plaguing humanity forever. And I guess the, the point of this particular slide is just to tell you the interesting aspect that as long ago as you know so the 1700s people like Daniel Bernoulli were already trying to understand from a mathematical applied mathematical physical mathematical point of view the time evolution of viruses as you can see here the title of this essay is um, essay on a new analysis of the mortality caused by a smallpox and of the advantages of inoculation in order to prevent it by Daniel Bernoulli, and then I love the way it starts. It says "introduction apologetique," and um, you know it means an apologetic introduction. And again, I, I think that you know this shows the the range of the human mind. I talked in the "Why I'm So Boring" vignette about celebrating the achievements and the the somehow the 
the epic proportions of people's success in thinking about the natural world. And, you know, the natural world is everything. We're, we're allowed to ask questions about anything and everything, and often mathematicizing those questions sharpens them. In the right-hand side, you see the, the basis of what I'm going to talk about today, which is the paper from 1927 by Kermack and McKendrick on mathematical theory of epidemics. And for our purposes, that's going to go under the, the umbrella of what I will refer to as the SIR model. So if you were paying attention last year uh, to the early days of the pandemic, then you might remember that during White House press conferences, that sometimes they would show us graphs and they would present to us um, data and also projections. And the projections were intended to say something about the number of deaths that would occur by such and such a date. And what I wanted to comment on here briefly is the classes of theoretical analyses that were in play. Over on the left-hand side are some of the popular versions of what I would call empirical fits, especially the one on the bottom, which has been, gotten a lot of popularity because of the institute in Seattle where they've, they, they had the ear, let's say, of, of politicians and they made various projections. And I simply want to say that the projections were based effectively on a toy model, if you like, that says that the number of infections as a function of time goes like an error function. It's a three parameter thing that there's the width, there's the, uh, the, the midpoint, and then there's also the max, the saturation. On the right hand side is more in the spirit of what I'm going to talk about today, and that's what you could call mechanistic models in which we have, we separate the population into different subgroups such as the susceptible part, the infected part, the recovered part, maybe we include the exposed group and it, it infected with and without symptoms. You know, you can be more and more sophisticated with the number of different categories that are included in the model, but the, the essence of the thing is still the same, which is that one is trying to figure out what's the time evolution. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write down uh, three rate equations. The rate equations are going to tell us about the rate of change of the number of susceptibles, the rate of change of the number infected, and the number of uh, recovered or removed, uh, which in some cases sadly refers to people no longer being with us. And so you can see here that, um, that this model imagines that there's some rate constant beta that tells us how susceptibles are converted into infected. There's some recovery rate constant, which I'm gonna refer to as gamma, that tells you the rate at which infected become recovered. And at the bottom is an example of the outcome of the kind of rate equation models that I will briefly discuss. This is probably today more in the spirit of knowing about than knowing. I'm not going to go through a bunch of detailed calculations. I think at this point, maybe I've been belaboring these things. This is more just for the purposes of exposure and likely I'll give you the opportunity to uh, do some calculations yourself uh, in the form of a homework. Let me point something out that I think is very important for the current pandemic that we are living in this very instant on January 27th at 8.30 in the evening in San Francisco, California, where you know I was out in the world today on my bike and you know more or less every single person I saw was wearing a mask and you know it's, it's, we're living in a crazy time. This model has real implications and it gives an impression that I think is really important to avoid and that is this. This curve right here is the number of infected. And what you see is that it goes down, okay? And allied with that reduction is a reduction to zero of the number of susceptibles. And uh, the thing that I wanted to say that I think is very important is that we are not at all doing something like this. In other words, the number of susceptibles is not down to something like 20%. You know, we're, we're, way, we're way something like this. You know, I don't, I don't really know. I haven't looked at, at the data in a while, but the number of susceptibles is still very high. And I think that's the, the point that I wanted to make. Um, so let's see, I guess what I will do is, uh, again, in the spirit of knowing about rather than, you know, really knowing, let me just kind of walk you through the philosophy and logic of the SIR model. So as I already referred to, we're going to imagine that there's three populations, the susceptibles, the infected, and the recovered. 
and those populations will change over time. So that's why I've given them the label S of T. The total number of individuals in this model is constant and is called capital N. And we, we know that that constraint is going to be maintained despite the fact that S and I and R are themselves going to be changing. So the first equation for the number of susceptibles is the number of susceptibles now is the number of susceptibles before minus the number of people that were converted into infected. And I want you to notice that this term is minus sign because we subtracted from susceptible. And at the same time, we increased the number of infected, which you see down here. So this is infected now, infected before, those that were added to the infected population because of infection, and those that were removed from the infected population because of recovery. So, uh, so let me just comment, because this is something that came up earlier in the, in the term, is we, we talked about mass action, and I, and I did a little calculation of the probability of an encounter between a ligand and a receptor, for example. And what you see here is now I'm, I'm actually dividing space up into a lattice once again. This is very simple, oversimplified. And I, I have this lattice, and then I ask for the probability that in some locale that I'll have a susceptible and an infected together, because to get infected, you have to be in the presence of uh, somebody that's already infected. This is basically epidemiological version of the law of mass action and is the basis of this first equation that I wrote here, okay? So I can turn this into a differential equation, and here is the differential equation form. I already commented on the number of infected as a function of time. There's both a plus term and there's a minus term. The minus has to do with recovery, the plus has to do with people getting infected. So here's the differential equation for the number of infected. And then finally, the rate equation for the number of recovered, it's just an increasing function of the, the number of people um, that are infected. So I have three equations. And these equations can be recast in a dimensionless form by dividing by gamma, for example, as I show here. So what we will define is we will define uh, tau as being gamma times t. So this is our dimensionless time variable. And over on the right-hand side, I show you these equations um, in their dimensionless form. Okay, so now let me let me just comment on um, how to think about the dynamics. I'm not going to do the solution. I'm just going to give you a flavor for the kinds of solutions that come out of this. So, um, so here what I'm showing you is a phase portrait, basically. So what you see on this axis is uh, is s. That's the number of susceptibles down here, and here is the number of infected. And interestingly, the null Klein, so notice that when I wrote the equations, I had, uh, I had an equation for uh, di by dt, and that was equal to r times i times s minus 1 over r. And if I want this to be 0, in other words, if I'm interested in the null Klein, then there were there are basically two choices, either i is equal to zero or s is equal to one over r. So let's look at that on the phase portrait. So uh, sorry, I gotta wander around. But here is the uh, this is the s equals one over uh, actually gamma. Um, no, sorry. Uh, now I can't remember what I called it, but this is the 1 over r, yeah, I think I called it r. This is the 1 over r um, null line, this vertical line. Note that this is number of susceptibles, and therefore s equals 1 over r is a vertical line. And the point is, is that if the number of susceptibles, so, so another point that I want to make first, sorry, is that this region is inaccessible and out here. And the reason is because it violates our constraint that uh, S plus I plus R equals N. If I'm over in this region out here, 
I violated that constraint. So this, this is basically our, our constraint. And the point of this dynamics is that if the number of susceptibles is on this side, and I choose some initial condition like here, what will happen over time is that the number of infected is going up. Note that the y-axis is number of infected. So here it's going up. That means I have an epidemic. If I'm on this side, if the number of susceptibles is over here, then what that means is that uh, the, the, the growth rate is negative. So the, the, um, let's check that out. Uh, let me show you in the form of the equations, and then that should be, should be clear. Um, what I have here is um, I'm talking about this. And note that you know R is positive, I is positive, and so this thing, S minus 1 over R, can either be positive or negative. If S minus 1 over R is negative, that means DI by DT is negative, which means that the number of infected is decreasing. On the other hand, is if S is greater than 1 over R, then the number of infected is increasing. So the point of my, my little uh, examination, which I'm going to stop here, of the, the phase portrait was just to say that depending on where you are in the, in the SI plane, you can say whether or not the number of infected is going to go up or go down. And you can see, you know, we plotted the arrows here that, that correspond to, uh, I think I actually have it somewhere. Let's see here. Uh, sorry, it's probably giving seizures having to watch this, but um, ah, here we go. Yeah, so this is showing you the uh, the components of the vector, I'm going to call it the vector V, which is equal to uh, ds dt and di dt. So that's a vector. And for example, right here, you can see that uh, di by dt is positive and ds by dt is negative, And that leads to this net vector pointing in the upward direction, meaning that the number of infected is going up in time. Okay, so I want to summarize. I'm basically done with what I wanted to say. So, um, so you know, the outcome of this analysis is shown over here on the right, and I already gave you a, a feel for it, which is that the number of susceptible goes down, the number of infected goes up for a while, and then it goes down, and the number of recovered um, then takes over the population. So, uh, so that's the qualitative features of this thing. These are both examples of dengue fever outbreaks in South America, if I remember cor correctly, and their fit to the, the SIR model that I just showed you. I also wanted to make a point, a very important point that came out of this current pandemic, and that is that these models are not very predictive. This is a, from a really interesting paper from a Spanish group, and I should have posted the, um, the citation. And the point I want to make is this, you know, these are the zones of uncertainty of the prediction. And the point is, is that if you fit to early data, like here, the models are basically indistinguishable. And what that leaves us with is an incapacity to make long-term predictions. So that's, that's the thing I think I wanted to say there. Um, my, my final sort of comment is that you know, it was a 200-year exercise from the time that Newton articulated the universal law of gravitation until we really were convinced that celestial mechanics held together, the inverse square law worked, that they could think properly about the three-body problem, the Jupiter-Saturn-Sun system, or Earth-Moon-Sun system. Those are the three-body problems. And people worked very hard to get to the bottom of these things. What I would say is that you know we're, we're living in the era of viral mechanics, and the pandemic has illustrated, you know, well, there may be people that don't agree with me, and I'd be very happy to discuss with them and, and learn more about it, but what I would claim, based on trying to read the literature very carefully, is that, that there's much to be learned yet about how to do the, the relevant mechanics of these things, including the human interventions and the human behavior and so on. And in many ways, I feel like the, the construction of a simple model system, maybe involving bacteria and their, their viruses, known as bacteriophages, could construct a model system that would become the hydrogen atom of epidemiology, but you know, where you have control of the knobs in order to really try to get, as I said, to the bottom of the underlying 
theoretical physics or mathematicization of epidemiology. And this is not to take anything away from those that work in this arena. It's just to say you know, that this is a really subtle and important area, and there's much still to be learned. So that's, that's uh, the essence of what I want to say, and likely this will show up in uh, some homeworks in the near future.